ಗಳಂ ಕುತಕದೆ ಕುತಕದ ದಿಂಗೆನ ತಮ್ ತಮ್ ವೆಲ್ಕಮ್ ಎವರಿ ಒನ್ ಆಲ್ ದ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಹೂ ಆರ್ ವ್ಯೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಅಸ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಫಾರ್ ಜಾಯಿನಿಂಗ್ ಅಸ್ ಇನ್ ದಿಸ್ ವೆಬಿನಾರ್ ವಿ ಅಪಾಲಜೈಸ್ ಫಾರ್ ದ ಯು ನೋ ಮಲ್ಟಿಪಲ್ ಎಂಡಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಲೈವ್ ಸ್ಟ್ರೀಮ್ ವಿಚ್ ವರ್ ಅನ್ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೆಕ್ಟೆಡ್ ಸೊ ಸಾರಿ ಫಾರ್ ದಟ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಫಾರ್ ಜಾಯಿನಿಂಗ್ ಬ್ಯಾಕ್ ಸೊ ಟುಡೇ ಸೆಷನ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಪಾರ್ಟ್ ಆಫ್ ಅ ಸೀರೀಸ್ ಆಫ್ ವೆಬಿನಾರ್ಸ್ ದಟ್ ವಿ ಆರ್ ಪ್ಲಾನಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಕಂಡಕ್ಟ್ ಡ್ಯೂರಿಂಗ್ ದಿಸ್ ಲಾಕ್ಡೌನ್ ಇನ್ ಅನ್ ಎಫರ್ಟ್ ಟು ಕೀಪ್ ಆರ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ಸ್ ಆಕ್ಯುಪೈಡ್ ಇನ್ ಯೂಸ್ಫುಲ್ ವೇಸ್ and also providing value to those of us uh, those of you who are watching uh, the people in the webinar today are uh, dr kp mohanan who we call mo uh, dr tara mohanan aditi and me rashmi a little bit about think before we begin for the viewers who don't know who we are uh, think is a collective of people uh, committed towards helping individuals uh, develop uh, their capacity uh, to construct and evaluate knowledge on their own our focus is on helping learners think like mathematicians scientists uh, philosophers historians and so on so uh, during the first uh, 20 30 minutes of this session mo tara and i will be discussing the two main questions uh, which you may have seen in the poster already uh, firstly what ought to be the purpose of education uh, in other words what should education be aiming at so we will be discussing what we think uh, are some of the ideal aims of uh education uh in addition we will also be asking ourselves the question who is a good teacher in context of these uh ideal aims uh we find this question uh, worth asking because even though the education system is uh, examination oriented uh we think that it is possible for teachers to help their students also become thinkers and inquirers in various ways uh so uh, i would like to the audience to post their questions in the comments uh, comment section of facebook uh, even though we will be taking questions only in the second half of uh, this session so uh, with that i think we can begin uh, the first question is uh, you know uh, addressed to mo uh, what according to you mo is the uh, you know should be the purpose of education well uh before i talk about what according to me is the purpose of education let me sketch three scenarios one is the school scenario the school culture in terms of the schools let's say parents and teachers and so on the purpose of education the purpose of uh, having uh, children in schools is to allow them to do well in exams exams so a school is good if large number of students do well in the exams now why is it that uh, it is important for them to do well in exams because it is important for them to get into the next stage of education the undergraduate education if you move from school culture to the undergraduate culture again we can ask the question how do they see the purpose of education the students and the parents and the education givers they see the typically see the purpose of education as employment so now this is employment oriented education um now we can ask yes of course it is important for people to find employment but there are also other ways of having an income without employment you can be self employed and you can also ask is um uh, income the sole purpose of education if you ask that question i'm pretty sure most people will be somewhat uncomfortable if you ask that question then automatically move towards the next uh, answer which is the purpose of the institution of education uh, let's say from class 1 to the end of the undergraduate program the non specialist is to help learners become educated so we could say this is educatedness oriented education what does that mean that means certain kinds of mental capacity certain abilities certain abilities to think certain ability to inquire to learn on your own communication and so on certain things that we regard as the hallmark of educated people of course we need to make this a little more precise what does it mean to say that a person is educated we could say something like there are certain intellectual abilities qualities certain ethical qualities certain qualities as a citizen certain pragmatic abilities we can discuss those things in detail but let's right now use the word educatedness 
So the answer to the question that you raised from my point of view is to help learners become educated beyond examinations, beyond employability. But these are included. Right. So uh, what you're trying to say is that uh, our education needs to go beyond uh, knowledge as information and yeah. maybe even knowledge as just mere understanding uh, into certain abilities that are transferable and will probably remain with us longer no matter what we choose to do later in life and of course contribute as uh, good citizens uh, in the world. Uh, but I... Yeah. Uh, I Sorry, I just want to tell the viewers that uh, Mo and Tara have a weak internet connection because of uh, some, uh, you know, unexpected rains in Bangalore. So their internet is a bit, sl a bit slow. So just want to let you know that. Uh, anyway, coming back to uh, this. Uh, so while these uh, certainly seem to be valuable aims of education, uh, is, it, is, it possible that, uh, is it possible for us to take them to the classroom? Uh, Tara, you said that you have certain experiences with taking uh, inquiry-oriented education, especially in the context of ethical inquiry uh, into the classroom. Uh, would you like to share that? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Rashmi. Um, now, we're, we're talking about inquiry-oriented education, right? And the, at the very root of inquiry-oriented education is the idea of education being oriented towards helping learners develop the ability to inquire. Now, instead of going into generalities about how this can be done, taken to the classroom and so on, let me take one striking example of a class session. It's a, it's a particularly moving session, and this is with the sixth graders. Um, and we're doing that. This was a session on what we call conceptual inquiry. Um, now, what I'm going to do is describe what happened in the class. It's, I'll, of course, skip a lot of detail. Um, it's going to be a longish kind of story, but there is something important and interesting that comes at the end. Okay, so let me describe the class. Um, the teacher, at, I mean, this part, the part I'm going to describe, that part, the teacher began by asking, suppose a cat on the street is really annoying you and you're angry with the cat. Um, would you kill the cat? The student said no. The subsequent conversation after that was all about killing creatures and that being a bad thing. Now, at one point, the teacher said, okay, now you've talked about different creatures and different scenarios. Can you think of a general principle such that your judgment that killing is a bad thing will be a consequence of that statement? Okay. Think about it. Um, I'll give you three minutes. Uh, talk within, talk amongst those in your group and write down what you come up with. And when you're all done, then we'll, you'll have to tell the class what you came up with. Now, notice that this is a way of uh, uh, creating space in the classroom for thinking and for working together. Okay, so those are the learning outcomes here. Now, most of the groups came up with something very similar and it was causing the death of creatures is a bad thing and the teacher wrote this, this on the board. Now there was further discussion and the children added a second principle saying causing suffering to creatures is bad so you don't torture them, you don't hurt them etc. Again notice what is happening here is the children are looking at specific scenarios and abstracting from there, they're generalizing from those scenarios. They're also formulating those generalizations as clearly and precisely as they can, right? But this is, um, this is something that they're getting practice in, uh, they're, they're getting experience of. At this point, the teacher went on to a very different kind of a scenario and said, suppose an Air Force officer is flying a plane and the plane is carrying bombs. It is passing over a village. Should you drop a bomb on the village? The, here, here, what happened was that the class was divided. Many of the students, of course, said no, because people would die. And uh, we have a principle there that says causing the death of creatures is bad. But there were some students who thought that it was OK to drop the bomb 
if it was an enemy village. Now, the moment that it was put that way, many of the students seemed to agree with them, right? And, and now what they're now seeing is a difference in ethical judgments and the consequences for action across individuals within that class, right? That's, again, a new experience, perhaps, for them. Um, so the teacher says, so by your principle, causing death is bad. Uh, it doesn't say anything about enemies. The teacher says this to those who said, yeah, it's okay to kill enemies. So, and the students together decided to modify their principle and say, causing the death of creatures is bad, except when they are our enemies, right? Now here, they are thinking of how they can fit their uh, principle uh, to their judgments of what is right and wrong. Okay. Um, so now when, uh, it, it's at this point that the class got even more interesting. The teacher said, what do you mean by enemies? Do you have any enemies in this class? The student said, no. Do you have any enemies in Pune? This class was happening in Pune. No. Do you have any enemies in Maharashtra? No. Do you have any enemies in India? No. So who are your enemies? The, the teacher said, you don't seem to have any. And the children said, um, the people in Pakistan, they are our enemies. So the teacher says, do you say that it's okay to drop bombs on villages in Pakistan? Yes. Okay, so there is a school in Pakistan and a sixth grade class in that school, you know, just like this one with children in it, like you, your age. So it's okay to drop a bomb on the school? No, not children. You can't kill children. The, the children were, the students were really excited at this point. Okay, so who can you kill then? And they said, Pakistani soldiers. So the teacher said, okay, so it's okay to kill soldiers. Let's go kill them, all of them. But some of these soldiers have children. And some of those children might be in that very school, in that class that we were talking about just now. Um, and they said, oh, you can't kill the parents of children. Uh, so what next? Well, the teacher says, you said that people in Pakistan are your enemies and that it's okay to kill enemies, so it should be okay to kill them, right? No. Uh, you can only kill bad people. It's okay to kill bad people. Only bad people are your enemies? Yes. Do bad people exist only in Pakistan? Aren't there any bad people in India? Yes, there are bad people in India too. Are they also your enemies? Or only those in Pakistan. Oh, no, no, all bad people are our enemies, and those in Pakistan and those in India. So it doesn't matter whether, whether they are Indians or Pakistanis or they're Hindus or Muslims or Christians, whoever, all bad people are your enemies, right? Yes. Uh, but then, who, are, who is a bad person? Now, Notice that until very clear, they were exploring the concept of enemy. And now they have a new concept to deal with, bad people or bad person. And this question seemed to, you know, uh, surprise the children. And they again discussed in groups and came up with an idea. They said the definition of a bad person is, a bad person is one who causes death or suffering to creatures. So, Look at the stages. They'd started with one concept, gone to another concept, modified. They come up with principles, generalizations, and then modified their generalization. And the class continued in this vein. And by the end of the session, the children had a set of principles from which they could derive logical consequences and arrive at conclusions. Now, what was really meaningful about this class, about this exercise, was the experience that it gave to the children, a situation um, that would help them develop certain abilities. And those abilities are what the teacher was aiming at. 
right? But what are those abilities? You have the ability to introspect, to dig into yourself and into your own value system, unearth your own biases, your prejudices, look at them rationally and arrive at ethical judgments. You also, in the process, unearth the moral principles, the ethical principles that underlie those judgments, your ethical judgments, and formulate those principles. You're articulating them as clearly and precisely as possible. And then you're looking at those principles and deriving the judgments from those principles. So there's a lot of reasoning happening there as well. And they're trying to understand why they judge something to be good or bad based on those principles. At the same time, making sure that there are no logical contradictions. So these are all very, very important um, learning outcomes in an inquiry class, right? And in the process, a couple of other things that they uh, also glimpse, get a glimpse into is they are seeing that moral judgments could be conflicting. Different people could have different moral judgments. And they also get a glimpse into designing thought experiments. What if I were in such and such situation? What would I do? And using the experiments to extract judgments as the basis for constructing your ethical moral principles. So it's a whole bunch of learning outcomes that are coming out of a session of this kind, right? Right. Now, um, the session is actually interweaving the rational and the ethical. It's ethical inquiry done as a form of rational inquiry. So this was an example of inquiry-oriented learning in the classroom, where the learning outcomes were constantly guided by the teacher. They were guiding the teacher and guiding the direction of the discussion, right? Hmm. Now, something that's very important to take away from this is uh, Tara, that the uh, learning could outcomes... You turn off, uh, could you turn off your video? The video? Uh, yeah, the sure. audio is a bit choppy. Yeah, okay. just turn off the video so that the audio can be clearer. All right. Done. Yeah. So what's important here is to see that um, the learning outcomes of the session can be transferred to any domain, whether it is math or the sciences, the biological sciences, the humans, is the humanities, or even the social, um, emotional, uh, even aesthetic domains. So that's what we are looking for in inquiry-oriented education, something that can be transferred across domains. Right. I, I can uh, completely understand, uh, you know, the idea of inquiry having an effect on the social and emotional uh, aspects of learning. Uh, you know, often we have very strong emotional associations with uh, knowledge, especially in, you know, areas like identity, which we just spoke about. And I think uh, it, it can make it really difficult for us to think clearly about some issues uh, and separating our emotional uh, responses from, uh, you know, rational actions. And what I really liked about your story was that uh, the children unpacked their concept of enemy and then proceeded into questions such as what is being good or what is being bad. And it was also remarkable how, uh, you know, they were able to revise their stand. Uh, purely on the basis of their own individual and collective uh, thinking. And, uh, you know, at this point, I would also like to share uh, uh, one of my experiences while, uh, you know, doing our course, IIE. Uh, another sort of possible emotional association one could have with learning is that of fear uh, within the classroom. Uh, you know, fear, anxiety related to uncertainty, uh, being wrong, uh, failing or not knowing the answer. Right. And I think uh, one of the things th that this course really helped me to do was, uh, you know, liberate me from this fear, which was sort of crippling me and, uh, you know, not allowing me to really embark on this learning journey. Because uh, once you're sort of liberated from uh, this fear, your mind just, you know, becomes a playground where you can play with your ideas, with your thoughts, and you can engage longer with problems because now uncertainty is a part of. Uh, you know, your life and your, uh, your learning. And you uh, also, it gives you the freedom to change your answer, not become attached to an opinion, 
uh, and evaluate everything you're doing uh, based on uh, your own thought process. So that was uh, an experience that, uh, you know, that really changed uh, the way I approach learning. And I think uh, if there is one thing that I would like education to be about uh, is, uh, you know, to eliminate fear from the minds of uh, people and help them become the best versions of themselves that is possible. Uh, and it's also interesting that it can be done across disciplines. And a lot of these abilities that uh, you mentioned, like, you know, clearly defining something and reasoning, uh, you know, unpacking concepts, all of these are uh, things that you would see in every, uh, every domain. So we did this in our webinar in physics on Sunday, uh, and we are planning to do something like this in history in our next webinar, which is uh, coming up on Sunday. Uh, so I think this is a good point to sort of uh, go into our, at least briefly, uh, into our second uh, question, uh, which is who is a good teacher? Uh, Mo, would you like to share your thoughts on that? Should I keep the video off, just uh, audio? Uh, yeah, you should keep should the video okay, off. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let me stick to teacher as a school teacher. Now, school teacher has two, two equally important functions. One, given the setup that we are in right now, given the pragmatic aspects, it's important that students do well in exams so that they can get into a higher education program. That is non-negotiable. It, it, the teachers do have to do that. But is that the only function? In fact, what we suggested in the previous discussion was that is not the only function. It is also important for teachers to help students become educated. So help students do well in exams and help students become educated. They both need to be done. Of course, that means that you have to allocate time. Exactly what the allocation should be, that's a different question. It could be 50-50. It could be 80% for exam coaching and 20% for becoming educated. It doesn't matter. Any good teacher needs to do both. And if you separate these two functions, then the, uh, is it possible for the same teacher to be good at both? Is it possible for a teacher to be good at coaching students for exams? Also, in becoming educated, some teachers may be good at both. But my suspicion is that not all teachers can do both equally well. So if you ask me, for example, I don't think I can help kids become uh, become good at doing well in exams. I can help them become educated, but I will not be able to do help them become good at answering exam questions because I'm myself very bad at answering exam questions. So maybe a good thing to do will be to, to ask teachers what they would like to do. Some teachers might uh, be good at exam coaching. Others may be good at helping kids to become educated. And then you can say a good teacher is one who can do either of them. Either coach students to do well in exams or help them become educated. That would be my answer. Should be good at one of these two important functions. Okay. Uh, Tara, uh, would you like to add anything to this? Um, yeah, actually, yes, because uh, more focused on the teacher as the functions of the teacher, right? right. Um, I would like to emphasize the person of the teacher in some sense, okay? Um, so one of the things that happens in, a, a, in any learning environment is we learn not just what we are taught or what is intended to be taught, we learn a whole bunch of other things. We look around, we imbibe things. Um, we start imitating teachers. We use teachers as role models and so on. And so um, a teacher needs to be aware that of, of this kind of learning. That a teacher is, a, you know, has to be aware that he or she is being watched by children and um, has to, you know, sort of moderate what they say, what they do based on that. So that awareness that mm. children learn, not just what is it. 
Um, a second thing, and there's a whole bunch of things, but I'm going to just pick three things. The second thing is a teacher's ability to learn and the awareness that in teaching, we also learn and learn from our students. And tied up with that, the ability to say in a class, if you're asked a question, the ability to say, um, I don't know, let's find out together. Not having to pretend that uh, I know everything. That actually it's a very liberating thing for the teacher to be able to do that. Right. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I have had uh, similar experiences too about, you know, when I say I don't know and, uh, you know, let's find out together. I think the students uh, just become like an equal, uh, they are no longer, you know, uh, listeners, but they are participants in what we are doing in the classroom. And I think uh, this applies to students of any age. And uh, it was also interesting what you said about teachers being role models, because uh, especially when we are younger, like if you ask kids in uh, first grade what they want to do in life, uh, a lot of people uh, tend to say, I want to be a teacher, uh, yes. which is so, uh, so interesting. Uh, so Tara, you also yeah. mentioned inquiry oriented <laughs> education a few times. Yeah. Uh, and um, can I just say one thing, Rashmi? Um, yeah. I think that was the point at which we got cut off. There was a third thing that also right. is very important for me in a teacher, which is the ability and the willingness to trust children and to respect them as we um, Now we're running out of time, so that I had a story I wanted to tell, but that's okay. Um, but that, I think, the ability to respect the children as individuals and not shout at them, not, you know, make them feel small and things like that. So right. that was the third thing. Right. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry, you were asking something. Yeah. Else. So, uh, yeah, before we, you know, uh, end our discussion, I just wanted to uh, talk to you about this inquiry oriented education that you uh, mentioned. And nowadays, you know, in this, in the education space, there are so many of these uh, terms floating around uh, inquiry-based learning, uh, game-based learning, task-based learning, project-based learning. So uh, is inquiry-oriented uh, education uh, just a new buzzword we are introducing into this uh, fertile soil? Um, well, I, I don't know if it has become a buzzword already. I don't think so. I hope not. But um, if it is used without really understanding what the concept is, if it gets widely enough used without understanding, then it will very easily become a buzzword. And I hope it won't. Uh, <laughs> it might be useful to distinguish between inquiry based learning and inquiry oriented learning, or do we don't have the time? No, I, I don't uh, have the time right now. So if somebody time. asks about it, can... yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Sorry, you were saying something? Uh, but, but, no, I was just saying that the inquiry-oriented learning that uh, we talk about in THINK uh, is something that has um, sort of developed for us over the past 40 years hmm. and has taken a lot of, you know, work and experience. And we've worked, it's, we've seen it work uh, at least all the way from second grade through school years through the undergraduate programs and graduate programs like the masters and PhD classes. Um, I've myself had experience all the way from trying to do inquiry oriented learning in second grade to all the way to PhD. So PhD classes. So yes, and it does, um, it does work. Right. So uh, very briefly before we move on to the Q and A part, uh, could you talk uh, very briefly about how, uh, you know, this conception, uh, the thinks conception of education uh, has, uh, you know, informed the way IIE, the course, uh, has been designed and also has been conducted uh, for the last five years. You want to do that? Um, it began with the question when we were teaching linguistics to undergraduate students. We asked the question, why are we doing this? What Earthly uses linguistics to the undergraduate students after they graduate. Uh, out of 100 students who do linguistics undergraduate degree, maybe one will go on to do graduate studies in linguistics. So did they waste their time 
learning this thing called linguistics? And her answer was, it is not linguistics per se, but certain mental abilities that you acquire by going through a linguistics program, which can be transferred to all other domains. Those are the important things. So we were not teaching linguistics. We were using linguistics to help them learn certain mental abilities, attitudes, values, and so on. And that resulted in uh, inquiry abilities, critical thinking abilities, and finally evolved into inquiry-oriented education as opposed to knowledge and specialization-oriented education. All right. uh, yeah, so that it's it's the experience of that that came into designing IIE, where we started out with. Um, actually, we can think of it in terms of two aspects. One is the tools of inquiry, and the tools, and some of those tools are what what came up in the um, ethical uh, inquiry classroom, like uh, defining yeah. and generalizing reasoning and so on and those are the, the tools are what in some sense are the foundations of the of IIE. Um, the other aspect is the okay. modes of inquiry so you have mathematical inquiry, scientific inquiry, philosophical inquiry and so on then the, uh, the question was what is it that is common to them and what is distinctive about them so that then became uh, uh, seeking for modes of inquiry. So those are the two kinds of components that go into IIE, primarily the tools more than the modes. Um, can I intervene at this point? Uh, we have been talking about IIE, but I just want to clarify what IIE is. Um, yes. Please IIE, go ahead. Yes, <laughs> IIE stands for Inquiry and Integration in Education. Uh, this is an annual online course offered by Think. Uh, in an attempt to take forward the conception of education that we just discussed with all of you. Uh, the, the main purpose of this course is to help participants uh, develop uh, inquiry abilities, tools of inquiry, and to learn about the modes of inquiry, uh, all of which we have been talking about for the last 15-20 uh, uh, minutes. Um, the course begins in May and the applications for the course are currently open. We'll talk about it some more uh, just now, but if you're interested in learning to become inquirers yourself, and uh, please, the details are on our Facebook page and our website. So do check them out after, do check that out after we finish this webinar. Uh, so that being said, would you like to add anything else about IIE and about what it tries to do? Perhaps not at this point. No. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay, I think uh, this is a good point to end our discussion and move on to the uh, questions. Uh, I request Aditi to anchor the Q&A part of the webinar now. Uh, thank you uh, for the discussion, Mohtara and Rashmi. Uh, the examples and the conversation was very insightful. Uh, I would also like to thank the participants in the webinar for posting their questions. Um, and broadly, uh, we will start with questions that are related to the first half of our discussion, which had to do with the purpose of education. And uh, we have Man who asks, how much is uh, we're talking about how much how much should we focus on uh, the concept content uh, while teaching in a classroom so can i request mo or tara to answer this oh, go ahead. yeah that depends upon what we mean by the content concept and at what level we should address it uh, we could address uh, concepts at the level of examinations what is it that they need to know in order to do well in the exams. You could also <clears throat> engage with concepts at a level at a, that is deeper. So what does it mean to say, for example, rotation and revolution? Uh, what does it mean to say species? Now we are going at a deeper level, not just exams, but more than exams. But this is still at the discipline specific level. The next level should be at the transdisciplinary level, 
So when you say migration of uh, uh, butterflies, for example, we can ask what is migration such that butterfly migration, human migration, cell migration, all these are examples of migration. If you ask that question, it becomes transdisciplinary. Meaning uh, cutting across disciplinary boundaries yeah. or transcending disciplinary yeah. boundaries. We could also engage with integration of different concepts. Then it becomes uh, much more enriching. So whether we deal with concepts at a very narrow level or at a broader and deeper and richer level, that's the choice that we need to make. So the answer to the question would depend upon what it is that we are aiming at. Right. Um, okay. Uh, the next question is from Nirja and she asks, uh, could you elaborate your thoughts on practical solutions to implement these ideas in regular schools? Um, okay. So, um, what, I mean, we are not <laughs> very practical, I guess, but the one thing that has, that we've done and it seems to have had some effect is to think in terms of what we call a dual curriculum. Okay, so there is the regular school curriculum. And if a school management is willing to give us two hours a week, say for the sixth grade, that's what we have done in one uh, group of schools where the management was very cooperative and gave us two hours of curricular time to do a course in inquiry for sixth graders. Right now, they did that and then went on and they had we did workshops for them later on. Uh, some of them came back and did our um, in inquiry and integration in education course and so on. And um, that is one way. Obviously, we can't change the entire curriculum. So this is one way to bring a little bit of inquiry into the teaching, in, into the curriculum and also have teachers who are interested come and join the team to do that teaching and to take it to other classes in such a way that they can then bring a little bit of it wherever possible into the actual teaching of other subjects as well, even the examination oriented uh, classes. Okay? And one way to do this, one way for this to work is for teachers to, for instance, do this course the inquiry and integration in education course, because that would give them something to fall back on. Right? I, should, um, I should also add that if you are aiming at, let's say, two hours a week of uh, inquiry and critical thinking, assume that a school allocates 25 hours a week, and out of 25 hours a week, we are allocating two hours, which is very small. But what that means is that 8% of the curricular time should be allocated to this, 8%. That also means 8% of the teachers should be dedicated to helping learners become efficient inquirers. But then teachers have to learn how to engage in inquiry. And this is where the management comes in. Management has to give time for teachers to learn and our experience has been, by and large, <clears throat> that is difficult for the management, for whatever reasons. So this is a practical problem. Uh, we don't know what the solution is. This is a possible solution. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, I think that covers a few other questions that uh, participants had posted about the role of the school system in uh, enabling uh, an inquiry-oriented education system. Uh, now there is uh, there is one question by Tapomoy, and the question is that while the purpose of education is the erasure of the instructor and making the learner autonomous, how does the strong presence of the instructor and her authority over the way learning happens, how can uh, the entire guidance through inquiry be synced with the idea of self erasure? If I may rephrase this question a little bit, uh, given that the system, the education system uh, would seize the teacher as sort of an invisible cog in the entire mechanism. And given that the teacher is also an authority figure in the classroom, uh, is there a way that the teacher can balance these two and at the same time help a learner develop 
the ability to think. Yeah, actually, um, this what's what the easier in education because um, the very system of education is making the learner inquire for themselves and questioning the three part, there is the inquiry uh, the thinking inquiry and questioning the questioning part where they're questioning a themselves b others and the others includes the teacher so you're actually we are actually teaching uh, learners to challenge us to challenge the teachers and any authority so that's in fact the best way to make yourself dispensable yeah but on the other hand i wouldn't use the word teacher erasure for this process yeah, yeah. notice that a teacher who helps the learner challenge the teacher is very much there in the classroom is a valuable teacher and is a co-learner yeah yeah with the with the learner so what right. what is erased is the authority yeah. of the teacher yeah. not the teacher yeah. yeah so the uh, one more thing to add there is that the role of the teacher is uh, you know the way it's traditionally seen is an instructor uh, whereas this sort of transforms that notion of a teacher into someone who is a facilitator of learning yeah. and also a learner uh, a co-learner like uh, Tara and Mo put it. Yeah. Uh, so, in in uh, uh, Manjusha suggests in the comments that you suggest that a teacher plays a role of a catalyst and makes the children explore and revisit their own notions. I think that's precisely yes. uh, what we're talking about. Uh, not just the teacher helping children revisit their own notions, but also actually revisiting her or his own notions. Uh, of the concepts that they think they know. Uh, we have a question from Chris, who says, what is the difference between inquiry-based learning and inquiry-oriented learning? Is it that in IBL curriculum uses inquiry to teach a particular subject and the other develops the inquiry skill itself? Won't IBL or inquiry-based learning develop, also develop inquiry skills? Why do we need IOE? or inquiry-oriented education. Okay, can I take that? Yes. Um, okay, so when we talk about inquiry-based learning, you're basing your learning in a particular strategy or a pedagogy, a means of learning, right? And um, for this, uh, it, it's like any of the other many ways of learning, um, whether it's through problem-based learning or project-based learning or activity-based, task-based learning. So different ways of bases for learning, but you could be learning exactly the same thing. You could be, cons you could be uh, getting knowledge, arriving at knowledge through any of these, right? In inquiry-oriented education on the other, the inquiry part is the goal of education itself. So the learning outcomes are in terms of inquiry concepts, understanding of inquiry concepts, and developing inquiry abilities like reasoning and evaluating claims and theories, um, justifying and establishing claims, uh, thinking critically, and so on. So, and, and these, once you have these abilities, you can use them anywhere at all, um, whether in a particular subject or across subjects, whether in your personal life or, you know, even in the personal professional divide, if there is one in an individual. So that's the most important difference between the two. Um, the other is when you talk about inquiry-based learning, you find that typically it is still used, it's just a methodology that's being used, but to arrive still at knowledge. So it's knowledge-oriented education using inquiry-based learning. Whereas with inquiry-oriented uh, education, the orientation is different. The third difference, which is a consequence of what um, these things are, in, in um, inquiry-based learning, you could, be, you know, you could do this within a particular discipline or subject or subject group. Typically, it's done within a subject, 
right? But inquiry-oriented learning, when you're talking about abilities that cut across disciplines, transcend disciplines, then you're talking about something that is transdisciplinary. You're, there are concepts that cut across disciplines. There are abilities that cut across disciplines. So those are your focus, and you can use them anywhere. So those, I think, are the three main differences between inquiry-based learning and inquiry-oriented education. Let me um, add to what Tara said by contrasting inquiry as inquiry activities as a pedagogy. Contrast that with exposition as another pedagogy. Now, inquiry-oriented education has nothing against exposition. If exposition is needed, we use it. For example, suppose we want students to understand the distinction between correlation and position, and this understanding is important for inquiry. Then we have no problems in giving a 15-minute lecture or even a one-hour lecture on the distinction between correlation and position. We often do that. But in inquiry-based learning, they would expect children to get this through inquiry. That is impossible, number one. Number two, notice that the topic Correlation and causation is not part of the school curriculum. So inquiry-based education will not even bother to address that issue. But in inquiry-oriented education, understanding of that concept, conceptual distinction is important. So there are many yeah. areas where the, the inquiry-based pedagogy will not be able to... Will not enter. They will not, yeah, they will not come in. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. So we have, uh, we have a question from Padma and she asks, isn't this whole notion of co-learner a little overused in the sense that does it allow for anyone without content mastery and pedagogic skills to say I'm a co-learner? Uh, she says she's seeing that happening in so many places where people get burnt out in other jobs and think they can quote unquote teach. Um, and sorry, before I... Uh, request you to answer that question. I'd like to tell the participants that uh, we thank you for posting your, all, all your questions, but we may not be able to answer all of them. Uh, we will try to by answering uh, these questions in the comments after the webinar, but for now, please accept our apologies if your question is not answered. Um, with that, Mo, or Tara, or Rashmi. Uh. I think more Tara could answer this one. Are they on? Um, okay. So shall we? Uh, all right. Let's come back to this question in a little bit then. Yeah. Um, and I think, uh, Rashmi, uh, I have a question for you to answer. Um, Soumya asks, as you said, peer should not be a part of education, but competitive exams do induce peer in students. So how would you test a student's performance formally without agitating them? Um, I think there are ways in which uh, one, one could, uh, you know, test the performance of a student uh, by, you know, giving them time to, of course, like competitive uh, examinations are probably not the uh, you know, best thing here uh, for this kind of education. And it's, uh, I mean, I do agree that uh, it's, it's bound to, uh, you know, stress uh, children out. But it is, it is possible that uh, you, you can test uh, how children are developing uh, certain abilities and knowledge and how they are transforming uh, over time. Uh, of course, this has a lot of practical issues and, you know, uh, we recognize that uh, in the sense that uh, this, is, this works when there are uh, you know, fewer children in a classroom and it works when uh, there are, uh, say, more teachers or more time being devoted to the uh, actual assessment, which uh, I realize a lot of uh, teachers don't really have the uh, liberty of, you know, uh, of, of that. Uh, Aditi, would you like to add something? Uh, my experience in school as well, where fear was a very important uh, element in my learning. And uh, I wasn't, by learning, I mean in my performance, in my examinations. But uh, what I realized is that to be open to new ideas, uh, we need to uh, help children um, overcome the fear of making mistakes. And 
one way to test them would be to test them in a manner that allows them to make mistakes and doesn't penalize mistakes uh, and so competitive exams clearly to as rashmi said would not be uh, the ideal way to go about that um all right let's see so Somya uh, asks us that inquiry based learning gives a very nice and enriching learning experience but how come most conventional schools show certain reluctance to accept this uh, just want your opinion on this okay so um okay uh, aditi hi i've joined montara seem to have dropped off the call uh, so hi i'm madhav uh, okay uh so your question was about um uh creating sorry can you just go repeat your question yeah again? i'll repeat the the most recent yeah. question i asked and then i'll go back to one of the questions that we had parked we are back okay. oh we are back okay great okay <laughs> all so right i can okay given that uh, we are close to 6 pm i think we'll just answer the two questions that i have verbalized so far and uh we will um sort of quickly wrap up after that um so let me repeat my question somya asks that inquiry based learning gives a very nice and enriching learning experience but how come most conventional schools show certain reluctance to accept this she um yeah we are not probably the right people to answer that actually when we can just say first mm -hmm. of all i want to uh, contrast inquiry based learning with inquiry oriented learning let me emphasize inquiry oriented learning where inquiry based learning is only one of the pedagogies now to use it as a pedagogy it is important for the teacher to have to become an inquirer that takes time that takes time and effort so if that is not possible that the system does not permit the teacher to invest time to become an inquirer this will take about a couple of years but at least one year yeah uh, and i think it is a fear of learning something new and the fear of allowing the teacher to invest time on something that is not necessary for helping students to get marks those are the obstacles yeah and i think in addition to that there's also uh, an inquiry based learning class itself uh, would take much longer than just uh, you know providing the piece of knowledge or piece of information that uh, you aim to reach at in the end right so either you could uh, tell somebody the earth is round uh, or you could sort of engage in like a 45 minute discussion about it uh, and then uh, you know get the children to arrive at that which is what uh, would happen in inquiry based learning so it sometimes uh, you know people find it Uh, a trivial thing to you know uh, to spend 45 minutes on and given the pressures of the examinations and the system uh, i don't think schools can yeah. often afford that time so yeah, yeah. actually yeah. Children, children have said well if teachers teach it like that then they won't finish the syllabus that's what they are worried yeah. about <laughs> let let yeah. me take a concrete example take uh, the... more i'm sorry i'm we're close to the end okay uh, so we'll i'm going to have to yeah. yes we can take this up in our uh, next uh, webinar if if uh, people would like we can have another follow up conversation yeah about this uh i would uh, apologize to padma for having verbalized her question but not being able to address it uh, we will probably reply in the comment section uh, later so um rashmi would you like to uh, wrap up this session and also talk about iie and where people can find more details about the course yeah uh, so uh, thank you everybody for joining us today uh, i really apologize for all the connection uh, issues and you know video and audio problems that are in today uh, it's just something unavoidable i guess uh, we hope uh, you found something valuable uh, despite these challenges and we will be doing a webinar once again on sunday and this time it will be an example of a session that uses uh, history to develop inquiry abilities in the classroom uh, this webinar is actually for a general audience although educators will find it valuable too 
the posters and announcements will come up soon so you can uh, follow our facebook page to get notified uh, we also now have an events page on our website uh, where you will be able to find these uh, you can also subscribe to our youtube channel where the recordings of these webinars will be available uh, if you wish to share them with uh, people you know who could not attend today's webinar and uh, we really really uh, you know enjoy these sessions and interacting with uh, all of you uh, so uh, a little bit about uh, the course inquiry and integration in education uh, before we uh, conclude the webinar uh, this course is uh, basically a 22 week uh, course with uh, which contains uh, 10 what we call learning triggers and each learning trigger explores one inquiry ability using one of the several modes of inquiry that uh, tara uh, spoke about uh, it you know uh, encourages people from various educational and uh, professional uh, backgrounds to form a learning community where we are all learners and uh, you could you can find out more about uh, the course on our website uh, think.education uh, the application deadline for this is 1st of may so if you are interested uh, please write to us and uh, also the application form and everything is on the link that uh, i just told you uh, www.thinkeducation.ie uh, uh, so you should be able to find all the information there uh, yeah we we really enjoyed uh, this session interacting with you uh, and we hope to see you all again soon uh, hopefully in the sunday webinar uh, thanks once again for tuning in and until ne next time take care and stay safe bye 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 bye, bye. Attack, the gather, the dump. 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 Attack,